Well, today's a, a very special day. It's the, the 90th anniversary of the founding of the Buddhist Society in 1924. And uh, we're very lucky today to have an introductory talk in the morning by my very good friend, Dr. Adayan Chakrabarti. And the title of this talk is... The Blind One Saw the Jewel. The Blind One Saw the Jewel, which is taken from one of the Upanishads. I'm not going to take up a lot of time going, uh, introducing Adayan, but just enough to say that he's been a very long time member of the society. He's trained in the Zen tradition, Rinzai Zen tradition. He's a member of the council, as chairman occasionally of the council, and also is assistant editor of The Middle Way. And we're very grateful to you, Adayan, to, to come here today. We know you're very busy works as a psychiatrist, very busy psychiatrist and has come down from Manchester, is it? Yes. From Manchester to be with us today. So, Darren, thank you very, very much for being here. It's a pleasure. Here. Thank you. Um, just, as a, just as a quick, just a question to you, and that is we were thinking of having Sunday morning meetings for the Buddhist Society, which would be probably no more than an hour. It would be a simple talk and then a bit of meditation and then away. You wondered what the audience uh, thought of that. We haven't used. We haven't actually done it before. But we're thinking of introducing it. At what time did it start? About eleven. Ooh. I mean, people might like the idea of that. Mm -hmm. Just a straw poll. Yes. I mean, just be very quick, simple, nothing too much. Just a bit of quietness with others, and then away. Anyway, we're going to try it out probably late May. See how it goes. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your response. And thank Diane, you. thank you very, thank you. very much. Thank Pleasure. You. Pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Friends in the Dharma, welcome you here on a very auspicious day. This is the 90th anniversary of the Buddhist Society. It's also Founders Day. Uh, President of former times, uh, the late Christmas Humphreys. I'll come back to him in a little bit, but I'll start off with something else from a different source. Um, the water of life, the holy water, it decided to make itself known on the face of the earth to mankind, and one day it just bubbled up. From deep within the bowels of the earth, it came up through an artesian well, and it presented itself. And mankind got to know about this water, this holy water, and they started drinking it, and they got nourished by it, and they were made whole by it. But as inevitably happens, people got quite possessive about this water, and they put a fence around the well, and then they started controlling the water. And then they decided who to let in to have this water. And it then it all turned a bit sad, and people were eliminated. And then people got hung up on the power and the dark aspects of controlling this profound, powerful essence of life. Understandably, the holy water got quite angry and offended, and so it stopped bubbling up through that particular well. And it emerged somewhere else. But of course, the people controlling the original well were so engrossed in their power games or whatever, didn't actually see that the water had dried up long ago and they continued playing their games. But a few courageous seekers realized that this is the water of life, it simply cannot go away and disappear forever, so they very boldly went into uncharted territory and searched deep and hard and came across this water again elsewhere. 
And guess what happened? In due course, the same cycle repeated itself. Again, the wrong people got involved. And again, the holy water was abused. And again, the water was offended and then went elsewhere. And this really has been the story, the history of religion, hasn't it? Ever since. Well, the good thing is, of course, the water is there ever, forever, and it does bubble up. It may come up in unusual sources, not where, quite where you expect it, but thankfully <coughs> it's there. And this water has cropped up here in the West as well. I mean, 150 years ago, if you had Buddhist inclination, there wasn't a lot here. And if you look at some of the early Western interpretation of Buddhism, it's actually, some of it isn't quite there. It's quite cynical. It's seen in a very negative way. If you look at some of the early translations, I mean, not all of them, some were pioneers, but a lot of it was seen in the wrong way. And the joy and beauty and all the compassion and wisdom that was there, that is there, was, was not appreciated and invariably it was compared with Christianity and it was looked through a Western prism, which didn't help. And we had a pioneer like Christmas Humphreys, our founder, our first president, who, despite all the odds, I mean, in those days, you know, the, the 1920s, where science was triumphing and man had so-called conquered nature and all that, in those days, rationalism and the intellect was, was everything that everybody went for. And so can you imagine, for an educated Western man, a top judge, to be into something odd, something different, something alien, a lot of people were ridiculed and they had to go through a lot of personal sacrifice to persist in this. I mean, today we take Buddhism for granted. We see it everywhere. Yoga, Buddhism, all things Eastern, Zen, everything. It's almost at certain times, that's in certain quarters, it's become a fashion thing. But in those days it was difficult. So... On this particular day, we are very grateful that <coughs> our founder did what he did and here we are sat today in this lovely building and we have the freedom to practice our beliefs because if we look around us, all over the world, there's an awful lot of religious oppression and people simply cannot go about their daily lives. So we owe a deep debt of gratitude to our founder and later on this afternoon Desmond will be going into a bit about 90 years of Buddhism, Buddhism in the West, what has Buddhism done in the West, what has the West done to Buddhism, so I won't go into that. Um, but let us remind ourselves again that we owe a deep gratitude not just to Christmas Humphreys Founders Day but the early pioneers, members are of our society, the likes of Dr. Conzer, Eric Cheatham, and many others who have been through these doors. I say, I started off with this story of the water of life, the well, because we can do the same thing with Buddhism. We think we read it, we study it, we might have been practicing it for many years, but we can actually misappropriate Buddhism itself and we have to be very careful about that that it doesn't become my spin on Buddhism my particular individual take on Buddhism which is why it's so important that study and practice match each other by study I mean reading the traditional doctrine sutras, shastras, all that and actually daily life practice because if we just study then it's all in the head and it's not actually lived in the body and it's not our being it's more what we know 
intellectually and again the wrong reasons set in so we always have to be mindful of our motives and also to retain that beginner's heart you know when you first came into the practice there were very little preconceptions one was open to new ideas new possibilities one was like the little child open looking searching seeking but as usually happens after a few years and we do acquire a lot of knowledge we get to learn all the technical terms in sanskrit or pali or chinese or japanese or whatever <clears throat> and it might start getting to our heads i know i know this and that's when it starts getting quite dangerous and so it's always important to refresh our attitude and to actually look elsewhere if need be because insight by definition doesn't usually come in through the back through the front door it usually comes in through the back door so when i start the practice i might think yes sitting on a meditation cushion that's that's what practice is all about and many beginners have this misconception i'll meditate my way through and the more i meditate that's what it's all about but as we find out sooner if the practice is going well that actually it's not just sitting on the cushion it's 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 daily life and everything we do we can bring a meditative calmness a serenity into our daily lives and actually it's all meditation every moment of our daily lives it's how we go about it and that's one of the first thing our teachers say we're also encouraged to study various other things like apart from the mainstream doctrine for instance one of the powerful tools in buddhism is the jataka stories you know those stories of the buddha's former lives while he was a training bodhisattva an enlightening being he wasn't quite the buddha but these jataka stories a lot of them in fact most of them are very similar to fairy tales they're very simple on one level and a lot of people certainly myself included when one first comes across it as an adult there's a tendency to kind of not take it very seriously oh these are kids tales they're only fairy tales they're not real they're preposterous some of them and that's something we need to look into because that innocence that is in those fairy tales actually is quite profound and deep and these tales are similar to myths that they they have come down from time immemorial these are in the days when man hadn't developed a modern psychological language see nowadays we talk about repression and expression and projection and all these defense mechanisms and most educated people whether they're professional psychologists or analysts or not most educated cultured people nowadays have some awareness and actually um it is very important in our buddhist training to be aware of what's going on inside us and more often than not what's going on inside us is we have a certain face mask we have lots of masks Uh, i as a doctor will invariably need a certain mask at work hopefully i don't bring the same mask back home with my wife and children and hopefully that's not the same mask with my friends or colleagues we have and when i'm with little children again it's a different mask so it's it's not a negative thing but the point is these are different aspects of our whole personality and some of it we are hopefully aware of but most of it we are clearly unaware of and actually that's what training is from one perspective um the word religion comes from the latin re ligio to reunite to become whole again what that implies is 
there was a split um, in philosophical terms. Unity has been split into duality, which basically means I, the subject, you, the object, and the process of observing. Um, there is a trinity going on there. So this is a philosophical way of looking at it. But simply put, we all know deep inside that we do things that we don't want to. We end up saying things that we shouldn't have said. I don't know what came over me. I don't know what possessed me. I was carried away. You know, these kind of things. And we still do it. Hopefully, those of us in the training that have been around for a few years, not as much, but again, let us remind ourselves that we need to put in more effort and not rest on our laurels. So, it's important to know these things that are going on inside us and whether you call it mindfulness or awareness or whatever, insight vipassana, insight meditation, that's what it's all about. It's about not getting so carried away by my daily chores, by my... Of course we have to exist in the world, we have to pay bills, we have our livelihood, professions, but not to get so carried away in our daily chores that we forget what it's all about. And that's where the training is really about. It's becoming whole again, or in modern psychological parlance, connecting, bridging the gap between the conscious and the unconscious, and letting things come up from deep within. And quite often, when we start meditating quite seriously, we notice all these things welling up, and we have to deal with them. Because without dealing with our problems, our baggage, so to speak, we're not going to really proceed much further in the training. And we have seen many people who have come here who put in a lot of effort and then perhaps they develop panic attacks or anxiety or they had unresolved issues. And that's also part of the training, getting familiar with ourselves. So nowadays we have developed this modern psychological parlance, you know, which we are coming to grips with. Uh, but in the old days, our ancestors, they didn't have this language. So what they did is they personified the, the gods and the demons within us. And you know what I mean, gods and demons. We can get states of inflation, can't we, where we think we are almighty. I mean, I remember coming back from a, a long retreat once and, you know, um, you know, it all got to my head a little bit because all that silence and discipline and meditating 10 hours a day for six days, it obviously does things, it, it brings things up. And, and our teachers always used to warn us, be very careful when you go back home because the tendency is to let it all out and, and infect anybody and everybody with it. And do you remember, you know, when you first got into this, you know, you had to tell everybody about Buddhism and, you know, it, it meant so much to you and all that kind of stuff. And we can develop a sense of inflation and power and grandiosity. Or we can also sort of recoil into our shells. Something happens to us in life and you know, we can adopt the victim mentality and sort of go into ourselves and feel rather sorry for ourselves and, oh, they don't understand me. If only people would understand me better. I'm trying so hard. Or, if only the world would change. If only this, you know, the classic example we give is, you know, when you start meditating and there's a car, a siren outside. Oh, why can't they... All that kind of rubbish. And we begin to see these various patterns within ourselves. And these are the gods and the demons that, that we talk about. You know, when... Um, I mean, in, in Zen terms, we call it the bull. The bull is that bundle of energy that is within us. That primeval energy of life itself. The water of life. And this bull is not to be seen as our enemy. The bull, by the way, in psychology is called the shadow, because we all carry a shadow within us, things that I would rather not see into, things that I would rather not talk about. 
Because we would all like to think of ourselves as decent, good chaps, and we all like others to view us in that light, don't we? But in the training, the first and foremost requirement is a deep honesty to persistently, consistently look within, look within. And find out what's going on inside us. And we work with these things. So these are the gods and demons. And our ancestors, they personified these inner gods and demons as deities. So if you look at the Greek classics, if you read, for instance, uh, one of my favorites is Ovid Metamorphosis. I mean, it's amazing. And not just here in the West, but if you look at all cultures, from even cultures from Aboriginal cultures in Australia, African, the, um, the, the, the tribal people in the Namib, you know, all kind of Eskimo culture, you look at anything, and we're, we're talking about anthropology now. And the same myths, the same stories, the same struggles between good and bad, light and darkness crop up again and again and again. A lot of these myths, stories, and, and the Jataka stories, Buddha's former lives, are, are along those lines. They have common themes. And they're common to all of humanity. They're not age-specific, and they're not culture-specific. They are our human heritage. And they're you, they're all over the place, and, and, and you, you had these tales, myths developing somewhere in Siberia, somewhere in China, somewhere in Celtic. You have the Celtic tales, Parsifal and the Holy Grail and all that. And they all, if you read carefully, you'll see that they all have deeper symbolic meanings, and they all actually point towards the inner quest that we are basically doing. And sometimes we might have blocks, you know, you've been practicing Buddhism for many years and there is a block, there is a stalemate, apparently progress is not being made. Well, in the Mahayana tradition, you know, there's the two traditions uh, of Buddhism, the, the way of the elders, the Theravada, the old uh, Pali-based system, and the, the later offshoot which arose in northwestern India, um, about 250, 300 years after the passing of the Buddha, the Mahayana tradition. And actually, th there is very little difference between the two when you get down to it, but it's how it's presented. Um, um, Buddhism is beautiful in the sense that we have these different ways of presentation, which is important because we're all different human beings and the same approach clearly will not apply to everybody. Um, and that's why the Buddha was the great teacher, the great physician, because he looked at each one individually, and he, uh, just as a physici physician treats each case individually, you don't prescribe the same medicine to everybody, that's dangerous. Um, so there's the beauty of Buddhism. You have the philosophical aspect of it, the devotional aspect of it, the psychological aspect of it. Then you have the Jataka side, um, the, the simple village folk tales. Um, you have all these different strands. And therefore, it's important for us to explore all the possibilities. And in the Mahayana tradition, we have a famous, we have the four great vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to liberate them all. The deluding passions are countless. I vow to work through them all. The Dharma gates are manifold. I vow to read them all. And finally, the Buddha way is supreme. I vow to tread it to the end. The third line there, the Dharma gates are manifold. Dharma is obviously the way, the Buddha's way. And it's manifold. So it incorporates. So nowadays, um, scientists are coming up with amazing insights. Modern quantum physicists, they're kind of, you know, almost paraphrasing what the Buddha said two and a half thousand years ago. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And scientists for the last um, 60, 70 odd years, some of the top scientists, that is the Einsteins, the Niels Bohr's, the quantum physicists, 
um, that they're looking at matter and that they're saying the same thing, that this so-called thing called the table in front of me, when we look at it, actually it's a few electrons whizzing around a central nucleus and it's actually all empty space. So a lot of scientists are getting mystical insights into the nature of reality and some of them then do go on to spiritual training. And if you look at the li if you look at great literature, you just you have to go no further than Shakespeare. I mean, um, if you look at, for instance, Hamlet, you will see modern man's dichotomy, where he, there is a split in Hamlet. Tremendous injustice has been done to him and his family, and he's intellectualizing about it. He's split, and he just cannot make up his mind what to do. So, great literature, or something I've been reading recently, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, again, back to this shadow aspect of us. There is Dr. Jekyll, the perfectly honourable doctor, which, who in daylight presents one persona, one face, one mask, and then after dark, he becomes the beastly Mr. Hyde. And literature has a lot to offer us. And sometimes, we may be stuck in a tangle with our formal Buddhist doctrinal studies and we come at it from a different perspective and suddenly something, a great insight wells up because it's coming through the back door. So it is important to look, to look, whatever we do. So anthropology, modern depth psychology, myths, fairy tales, the Jatakas, science, all these things, they have something to offer us. Now, obviously, not everybody will go for everything, but these are tools. And don't forget, Buddhism itself is just a tool. If you remember the parable of the raft, of the, of the Buddha uh, said that once you get to the other shore, you don't carry this raft on your head, do you? That would be silly. What you do is you put the raft down gently. You don't kick it away and say, oh, I have made use of it, I don't need it anymore. You kick it away. You don't do that either because then you obviously haven't reached the other shore. You realise that this raft is a very valuable tool and it can be of use to others. And so Buddhism in itself is a tool. And, and we have to be careful at some stage in our training that we don't actually become attached to Buddhism itself. In fact, my own teacher, the Venerable Nyakyoni, uh, she did many years of Zen training in a, in a male-dominated uh, Zen monastery. Uh, she went off in 1960. You can imagine um, the culture in Japan at that time in a fully male monastery in Kyoto. And she spent 12 long years training there. And obviously, she had to go through tremendous hardship and experience a lot of problems that we probably don't. At the, uh, in this day and age and what she said was for her the hardest thing of all was to dismantle this profound thing that she had built up called Buddhism and to let go of that that was the hardest thing because when you give your life for something it means so much to you but eventually that too has to be dropped off otherwise we become rigid and we actually end up as fundamentalists and you just have to look around the world now and we are besieged by major religious fundamentalist problems where people insist this is the way and this is the only way. It says so in this book. But life isn't quite like that. Life is free-flowing. The water, the well of life, it doesn't stick to the one place. It serves its purpose and each of us, we have to go into uncharted territory ourselves and find our own personal path. Because if we imitate someone else's path, well, that's all we're doing. And actually, in the 50s and 60s, when Buddhism first came to the West, many people who are serious, they literally went East. They, they, um, uh, they dressed in Eastern clothes, they acted, they put it all on. Uh, and now we know that actually, we don't have to imitate. We can take the essence and we can still have our Western heritage and combine and lead to wholeness. There's no need to give up one and totally 
go to the other because it's all common to us all. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama keeps on saying, you know, there is no East, there is no West, there is no Young, there is no Old. It applies to us all. So, how do you know that we are kind of practicing in the right way? What are some of the pointers? Well, it's quite easy, you know. Uh, do you remember the story of the Buddha again? When, when he was first embarking on his uh, spiritual path uh, and, and after he came uh, from under the bow tree and he started going into the villages and towns, um, one of the um, tribes that he first met, they were called the Kalamas, and this is from the Kalama Sutra. The, the Kalamas um, happened to be on the spiritual highway. Basically, every reputable master at the time, they would always go through their particular territory. So this particular tribe ha had heard uh, the truth from many different renowned masters. And, and, and at the time in India, there were 96 different philosophical schools, including the materialists, the atheists, you name it, all sorts. The Jains, um, uh, the, the, the orthodox Brahmanical Hindu systems, uh, and, and the orthodox Brahmanical Hindu systems, they had about 40 subcategories. So, it, so understandably, the Kalamas were obviously very confused. And so one of them actually said to the Buddha, the, their tribal elder said, yeah, you say all this thing, it's wonderful, but you know, we're really confused. So and so says this, so and so says that, and uh, what are we to make of it all? And the Buddha said, absolutely, it's a very valid question, and it's right that you should start off with this question. Because, this is back to what I said earlier on, it could become my Buddhism. So, the Buddha then answered, well, ultimately the only way you will know is you put into practice what you've heard, and you will then know from within if it's conducive, wholesome, productive or not. You will know. And how will you know? Well, things that used to bother me a lot a few years ago, things that if you mentioned it to me, immediately I'll fly into a rage and you know what our weak points are. And it's quite an interesting experiment to do with a close friend, you know, after a few years of practice, put a little thing in there and see, you know, what he comes up with. Because many people will say, oh, I've found my peace now, you know, I'm at peace, I've uh, blah, blah, blah. And then a little thing is brought up and suddenly the whole thing collapses and the rage and not a lot has changed. But if you notice, if we notice that things are beginning to drop off, you know, those things that I simply couldn't do without, you know, um, getting, you know, profoundly drunk on a Friday night or mixing in the wrong company or this or that, all my foibles and issues, you know, slowly they're dropping off. Or in the workplace, you know, you're not having as much friction, you know, people are perhaps coming up to you for a bit of help. Um, I'll give you an example from my own example. I, I used to work in Hammersmith and Fulham for quite a few years and after about two and a half years um, uh, the, the job ended, they were cutting down, whatever. So I left and I went off elsewhere to work for about, uh, about eight months or something. And it was a very tough post. Um, a lot of these people sort of in a city, very deprived. A lot of people had come from foreign war-torn countries where they were abused, tortured, and it was hard, hard work, and I would see these people every two months, um, they were perhaps on benefits, there was no aspiration, they had nothing to look forward to, it was the same victim cycle going on and on. It was hard for them, it was hard for me, because I, I kind of see them every two months and I think, I'm doing nothing for these people, I'm not helping them. Anyway, so there were these feelings within me, but... Um, Eight months later, I went back to this same place, as, as destiny would have it, the very same job they, 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 they re-advertised, they, they found that they had to create the post again, and I went back there. Um, and then I realised the, the other doctors, were, other people, colleagues were telling me, my God, what did you do to your patients? Nothing we did was ever good enough, because they all were keeping on wanting to see you, and where is Dr Chakrabarti, why, why isn't he here? And, 
And all this time within me, I thought, I'm not really doing a lot. I, you know, they're not grateful or this. You know, they're my own inner reactions. And then when I went back and some of the patients saw me again and, you know, they hugged me or they were so grateful, it was actually very moving because that's when I realised that without knowing it, something actually does happen. And you don't have to... Somebody doesn't have to say thank you. Somebody doesn't have to applaud you in person. But in a strange, mysterious, silent kind of way, things happen. Things happen in the workplace. Things happen at home with your friends. Um, your friend is going through a difficult patch and he makes a phone call, whereas before you might be too busy in your own personal life or even Buddhist training. <laughs> I'm meditating, I haven't got time for you. But you do kind of have a bit more time for others, you're more considerate and in yourself you, you find a a bit of joy, you find that inner space, that calmness, that peace. And, and these are the signs that, yeah, the practice is going along the right ways. These are the signs, because <coughs> you do see many cases, you hear of many cases of even advanced so-called spiritual masters and teachers. And, uh, and again, when Buddhism first came to the West, you, you know, when, you know, the so-called beat Zen days in, in the swinging 60s, you know, there was a lot of shenanigans going on in those days. And, you know, these people were saying one thing in, in public, uh, and these masters, if you look at their personal lives, it was actually quite shocking. And every now and then, um, it still, um, you know, happens. And um, a famous mythologist, Joseph Campbell, where he used to say, there goes another one the gods have dragged away. <laughs> and it's very important to be very, very mindful of that because, you know, um, in this training, um, I don't want to use the word powers, but things do develop. I mean, you, um, you can, you do start seeing into things that, that one doesn't early on. And, and it is very... It's, in fact, it's very easy to manipulate people uh, and to go for that power guru thing, you know? And that's how cults develop. And quite often what's happened is this guru has a tremendous, powerful shadow inside him. What he did was he went into inner work and he got beguiled, seduced by the power aspect of it. Because, you know, if you see rich people, once they've got a lot of money, what's the next thing they go for? They go for the power thing, you know, people bowing to them and people treating them like a lord. Um, in, in ancient Hindu system, we call it the chakras, the various. So your first primitive chakra is the sensual one, the, the physical one, then the power chakras and things like that. Again, another complementary study, the chakras, or, 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 or you could look at the Chinese system, the Tao Te Ching, and, and you know, it's all the same thing coming from different angles. But it's just it might help us to perceive things better. So these are the things we look for in our daily practice. And they help us in our continual development. And we should always be on the lookout. We should never be closed off. Uh, because that's when we get very rigid and formulaic and doc doctrinal. Um, just to, just to sort of give an example on that particular theme, uh, just a small story from the Indian tradition. Um, a, a young acolyte, um, um, a celibate acolyte, was, was meditating on Krishna, and Krishna is one of the supreme uh, Trinitarian divinities in the Hindu pantheon. Um, he was meditating on Krishna, and off he went into the forest, as they do, and he sort of started meditating intensely and this went on for years and years after about 10 years Krishna up in the high heavens looked down and thought ah this young man he has worked hard and he has really applied himself and it is time that I I visited him and gave him a, a boon a blessing uh, but what Krishna did was and this is the this is the important bit what Krishna did was he didn't approach him from the front as this young man was meditating Krishna, Krishna when shall you come to me? Krishna, Krishna when will you come to me? Krishna, Krishna when will you come to me? 
Krishna approached him gently from behind, tapped him on the shoulder. Can't you see I'm meditating? Why do you have to disturb me? Poor Krishna, my goodness. And off he went. Krishna, Krishna, where have you come? Krishna. My, uh, my, my, my teacher, Venerable Mirkini, it was one of her favourite stories because that is what I'm trying to get through this talk is we can do our Buddhist training and, you know, the ladder is against, you know, the wrong wall. And it's very important to remember that. That another story exactly along the same lines, the great Asanga, the Indian Mahayana master, him, um, Asanga and his brother Vasudhandu, he started the Yogacara school, the consciousness only school, the two of them. And he meditated on the future Buddha, Maitreya, for years, and he went up into the high Himalayas, and there he sat meditating in a cave for years and years, and it didn't happen. And after about eight years, he got totally disillusioned, and he, he said to himself, well, maybe it's not in my karma, which is quite a humble thing to adopt, isn't it? Maybe it is not in my karma to get it this lifetime. Well... Having decided that, he left the cave. He thought, well, I shall lead my life as simply as possible without harming anything and wait for the grace. And as he was descending and approaching a marketplace, he saw this terrible shabby dog. It was covered in fleas, half its skin was missing, and it, it looked in tortured pain. It, you know, and basically everybody, you look at it and you try to avoid it and you know, walk away. You don't want to be infected. But Asanga, in his deep compassion, he looked at the dog, and uh, he was so moved by it that um, um, he picked it up and he started stroking it, caressing it. And at that point, Moitra appeared, appeared to him. It's quite a good one, isn't it? Just when we least expect it, it might come to us. But we put in our effort, the right kind of effort. We don't look for the results, but results do come all the time. It's just that we may not notice it. And it might sometimes be that a year later, suddenly hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Hindsight, ah, gosh, that thing really used to bug me for years. And now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's quite, quite, quite a, a, a shocking revelation when that happens. And, 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 it's, and the, the light gets loader. Uh, the, 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 the load gets lighter and, 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 and the breathing is a bit easier and, and, uh, and a joy starts swelling up. One other thing I'd like to talk about is humour. Um, I've seen many a stone-faced Buddhist, you know, they're sort of... Well, sort of, no... Nothing, you know. I remember once years ago, when I was a beginner, this is the sort of early 90s, and uh, one of the seniors in the Zen group was taking a beginner's class downstairs, and um, <laughs> this chap came in, kind of new age, dressed new age and all that, and uh, he wouldn't sit on the cushion, uh, and uh, our senior said, look, uh, when you're in here, yeah, these are the rules. You either sit on the cushion or a chair. He, he wouldn't sit on a cushion. He would sit on the carpet. He said, no, 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 I, I, I don't sit on cushions, whatever. So anyway, the senior sort of you know, said, no, this is how it is. Um, if you're in here, you either sit on a cushion or you sit on a chair or the door is open quite bluntly. Anyway, he grudgingly sat down. Um, afterwards, uh, after the sitting and a bit of a talk, we, we had tea downstairs in the kitchen uh, and, you know, somebody asked him... Uh, Hello, I'm, uh, have you had a good day? Good day, bad day. They're all the same to me. I mean, somebody asked him a simple question. Have you had a good day? 
good day, bad day. There was no smile on his face, you know. He was, he was trying to be a serious Buddhist, you know. And that's okay, that's part of the training. When we first came into, tra into the training, uh, when we were children, we wanted to impress our parents, our peers, um, uh, and we, we kind of, uh, you know, bring the same attitude into the training. We want to impress our teacher. We want to be the perfect Zen student or whatever. Uh, that's okay. But um, if that carries on for too long, then it's clearly not okay. And uh, beware the one without humour, because the one without humour who cannot laugh at a simple joke that every Tom, Dick and Harry will laugh at, he is now developing a deep, dark spiritual shadow. He's saying, I am a serious Buddhist. I take life very seriously. And on that particular theme, there's a lovely story, sort of um, from the Zen tradition. You know, a Zen master was going around his travels and he was passing through a village. Um, yeah, this, this is a true story about 150 years ago. And um, suddenly he heard a lot of lamentation and crying and wails and all that. So he sort of checked out what was going on. Uh, it turns out that one of the leading um, villagers, um, somebody had died in his household, you know. And obviously, in, in traditional culture, the whole village got together in mourning and everything. And the Zen master sort of knew these villagers as well. It was, you know, I mean, he, he, he knew quite a few of them personally. He used to give talks to them. One or two of them would even come and meditate with him from time to time in his hermitage. So um, he sat in with them and, and he started crying, you know, just like the rest of them. There was an old man there and he sort of, sort of looked at, he wasn't crying. He looked at the Zen master, went up to him and said, I thought you were a bit beyond all this. I thought you were a great Zen master and you were above all this and beyond all this. And the master replied, it's actually precisely this, this crime, that takes me beyond all this. And that's very moving because, you know, we're still human beings. You know, we haven't lost our common human touch. Somebody has a tragic event, you know. We don't suddenly say all is emptiness. You know, it's... it's it's not the right approach. There is a right approach and a right place for everything. Above all, this training, the last thing it does is to take away our decent humanity. You know, when people are suffering, to be above it all, to be removed from it all. And that is one of the early stages of spiritual progress because, and this is what happened to the Buddha. I mean, he could have, with his revelations, he even realised how difficult it was going to be for him to teach his way to people because the way cannot be taught, it has to be followed. He, he simply points, as he said, I point the way. But he could have stayed there under the tree in bliss, oming out. Many people do. It's actually very hard work to come back down from the mountaintop, to go back into the marketplace and deal with other people's problems, isn't it? I mean, we all, you don't have to be a professional analyst or a psychi psychiatrist. We all deal with other people's problems. Somebody in the home, your son, your daughter, your friend, somebody, you know, and, and you do that, don't we? We're not sort of aloof from it. And so the master said, you know, it is precisely this, these tears that take me beyond. So... The blind one saw the jewel. What's that about? Well, it comes from... Um, if you, a, a lot of the Buddhist stuff comes from the uh, classic phase of the Upanishads. The Upanishads were Hindu uh, philosophical doctrine that stretched over about 800 years to 1,000 years. And the later Upanishads, they have some profound things which, which are basically Buddhistic uh, 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 and very similar. And I sort of studied the Upanishads quite a lot uh, in, in my past. And, you know, some of it w w used to come across as very serious. And yes, it's sublime, but sometimes there was a sort of something lacking. And then one day I came across this little quartet. The blind one saw the jewel. The one without hands, he picked it up. The one without throat, he put it on, and the one without the voice, he sang its glory. When I first came across it, it was like, what on earth is this about? It seemed funny to me, 
The blind one saw the jaw. The one without hands, he picked it up. I'm kind of thinking, are these ancient ones having a laugh? Are they having a private joke or something? And then you sort of look into it and you think about it. And you, you know you've heard this thing about the third eye. Well, there's not a literal third eye that develops, is there? The third eye implies a new way of seeing, a, 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 a higher consciousness. The, a seeing without the eyes, a hearing without the ears. And we, we, we go back to the Heart Sutra again. Um, which, is, which is a, a famous uh, doctrine in the Mahayana tradition. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Um, the great Bodhisattva Avalokiteshwar, the Bodhisattva of, of, of compassion, he was practicing the profundities and he saw that there is no eye, there is no ear, there is no feeling, there is no blah, blah, blah. But clearly there is an eye, there is seeing. So, so what's going on? Well. It's the seeing without the eye. It's, it's, it's a deeper seeing. Because when we normally see something, we watch an object, let's, let's just stick to the eye consciousness. The eye sees something and immediately a judgment sets in, doesn't it? Oh, that's, she's pretty, you're ugly, you're short, you're tall. Or, oh, that's a lovely flash red car, sports car, I must have it. So our seeing becomes clouded by our judgments, which we in Buddhist parlance is back to the five skandhas, the five heaps, and we're talking about the fourth skanda, samskaras, the one... See, the seeing is pure. The pure seeing is seeing. That's given. But it's what we put onto the seeing. So, I see you in the morning at work. Good morning. You don't, you're probably lost in your own personal problem. You don't quite say good morning to me. But I don't leave it there, do I? Why didn't you say good morning? Did I say something to him yesterday? Maybe he's had an argument with his wife this morning. This is how we colour things. This is how we judge things all the time. So the seeing is never a pure seeing. The pure seeing is the seeing. And clearly, if a judgment is needed, in Buddhism we hear a lot about no thinking, but obviously we're not logs. There is a lot of right thinking that is needed. If we have to do something, if we have to prepare for something, thinking is right. And there is a time for thinking, but most of the time we're just running this inner film, inner film, and we're not actually seeing properly. I mean, in my case, for instance, for many years, patient comes in, hasn't even finished the first sentence, already I'm jumping to conclusions. Don't we do that? Do we actually wait for the other to finish their sentence? Or hear what they have to say? Do we give space? At least we could try that as an experiment, even though the judgments and the opinions are forming uh, that's karmically predetermined. You, we can't help that. What comes up, what is coming up right now in each of us is coming up. There's nothing anybody can do. What we can do is be aware of what is rising right now. Be it pain in his back, my friend here has back pain, or be it the sensation of the feet on the floor, or be it the sounds of my, my words coming in. Um, while you're hearing the sound, if suddenly a thought, oh, what's for dinner tonight? Well, that is coming up. That's karmically predetermined. Whatever rises will rise, depending on the train. But how we react to it, do we immediately push it? Not consciously, in a sense. We observe it and empty. Observe, empty. It's called... Uh, clearing and seeing, one way of looking at it. It comes in. Now, if it's obviously I'm having a discussion about something important, then obviously you do need to go into thought streams and consciously do it. But the point is, we're all the time unnecessarily engaging in all these irrelevant thought streams, opinions, judgments, which actually it's got nothing to do with the truth. I mean, that poor chap who didn't say good morning to me, he was simply absent-minded. You know, his boss had probably told him so. I don't know, whatever. But 
It's nothing to do with me necessarily, but I could get into a state about that. And then half an hour later, I project that negativity into my next interaction, perhaps with my patient or with my colleague. And isn't that what we do? A bundle of negativity infects one person, that person infects another person and another person. And so the world is where it is. So, humour. If we can laugh at ourselves every now and then and realise we struggle and we put in a lot of effort. But ultimately, that's all we can do. And we shouldn't get too controlling and say, this is how it must be and this is my way and I'm going to make sure it happens because you see that a lot, you see that a lot. So it's important to always lower the head, to lower the head and to go about humbly, open-eyed, trying to take it all in and not get too coloured by me and my opinions. Because that's all the, the Buddha's way simply is. The Buddha, the, 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 the inherent wisdom is already there. When something terrible or life-threatening happens, it takes over. And you hear many stories of amazing things. You know, people... Um, you know, in the most terrible of situations, coming up with the most compassionate, spontaneous, creative responses. And, and, and if we look at our lives, and if the training has gone well, there, we'll all pick out examples where, where something miraculous has happened. It has happened to all of us. I mean, the very fact that we talk, we do this, that in itself is a miracle. The, the miracle of just being. But unfortunately, unlike the little children that, that we once were, that bundle of energy joyfully playing around with life, um, we, we've kind of covered it up with our personal baggage. And for 25, 30, 35 odd years, we develop this dark shadow baggage. And then for the next 35, 45 years, we try to empty that bag. And that's all life is down to, isn't it? But... As long as we remind ourselves that, you know, um, it is not enough. I might be a learned professor. I might have read all the sutras. I might have gone to five retreats every year. Um, these are not important. You know, what is important is, you know, the friend rings and he's in trouble. And despite my issues, I have to have space to pick up the phone. Or uh, somebody in front, you know, maybe carrying an elderly person, carrying five bags and straining, maybe giving them a hand, you know what I mean. Basic, decent human, you know, sort of beings, you know, nothing too profound. So, we're grateful to our founder for providing us with this institution, a beautiful place, and it is a beautiful place. Um, I call it an o oasis in the, in, the, in the chaos of London. You know, you come into London for whatever reason and you have this beautiful place. There's a beautiful shrine room that you can go in on your own and find that space because it's so important, that space nowadays. People are running around obsessed with life and its problems. And yes, life has got very stressful and difficult. You know, um, there are lots of complexities and lots of pressures. But... Ultimately, it's up to us what we do with it. I mean, you know, beauty is out in the eye of the beholder. It isn't all doom and gloom. I know the newspapers and, and uh, news channels will tell you one thing, but, you know, there's a lot of beauty and joy and goodness out there. The water of life is always there. It's always bubbling up. It may not bubble up in the same place. You might have to look in a different place, but clearly, if we seek sincerely enough, it will always present to us. Okay, I, I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. There's any questions, anybody? Otherwise, um, I mean, uh, there are time for questions, but just to tell you about the format, um, we're, we're going to have a break for lunch, uh, and then um, there is a, an open period where people can either go to the library or they can come up here um, or go to the shrine room. And then um, Desmond, our president, who you met earlier on, he's going to come and give a talk at 3 o'clock um, on, on 90 years of Buddhism in the West. And that's going to go on for about an hour. And then we have uh, tea, coffee and refreshments downstairs. 
uh, where you, you got an opportunity to, to, to talk to the speakers and things. Um, any questions, anybody? Yes? What is it that observes all this inner activity? It is simply put awareness and it is best not to try to analyse that and describe it. It is that which witnesses everything. So, you are angry. Yes, you are angry. Suddenly the awareness arises. There is anger. Mm -hmm. That is simply awareness which is not personal. That is, that is the awareness. Universal. It, it is universal, but most people are on autopilot and the awareness that I am angry does not even arise. Actually, it is not even I am angry, it is there is anger. Mm. The awareness, so I'm really angry and about to look, oh, and you notice it in the body, the fist gets clenched, the voice gets choky, the sweat, so the, 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 you know, the stomach cramps, you know, all that body signs, the body always gives it away. And, and um, what we say is one thing, but what's underneath can be completely different. I'm so nice to see you, but the smile isn't genuine. Do you know what I mean? So same with anger or any passion or anything. Um, awareness simply picks it up. Okay, and uh, it's important. It is not my awareness. It's not even useful to analyze it at all. There is simply this open awareness that picks it up, and then, yes, a conscious effort is needed to get back to the here and now, which could be being angry with somebody, which could be shouting at your child, which could be slightly raising the tone of your voice, but it's done in conscious awareness and not in blind, passionate rejection. And you can tell, can't you, when somebody does. So um, Buddhism is, by all means, it's not telling you to be a doormat. And, and, and many early Buddhists and many people in the training, you know, they think that, you know, because I'm a Buddhist, I must always say yes. I must always be accommodating. No, 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 not at all. I mean, if you look at the genuine masters, they're quite tough. <laughs> so tough old beasts, you know, and some of them, on first impression, may seem, you know, you know, you know quite d disturbing, actually. But there is a purpose for it, you know, uh, and it's important for us to see that as well. And again, it's awareness that picks that up because, you know, does that does that answer? It it? Does, yeah. But it's best not to analyze it because once you start analyzing it, it's like the well. You are putting a fence around it. You are trying to control it. I want to understand what this is. It is not to be understood. It is a mystery to be lived. Mm. Humdi. Thank you. Any other questions? Right? Well, thank you very much for all this is Saturday, for sacrificing your Saturday morning. Thank you. Very nice to see you all. And... and uh, Thanks for your support of the Buddhist society. Without you guys, obviously, uh, you know, to, uh, it won't be that easy. So we all need to support each other, help each other, and and that's that's the training. That's that's it. And and obviously you are here. So hopefully we all get something out of it. Thank you very much. Okay.